Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's ASI Let's Grow webinar titled Animal Health Management, Keeping Track of It All and Making Good Decisions. My name is Jay Parsons. I'm a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm also the operational leader for research in the Center for Ag Profitability. I'm pleased to be joined this evening by Dr. Jim Logan, Dan Persons, and Dr. Larry Getz. We will provide more information uh, introducing each of these speakers here in a moment, but for now, good evening, gentlemen. It's good to have you on. Let me Thanks, start by Jim. saying this evening's webinar is brought to you by the American Sheep Industry Association and made possible with funding support from the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS. We want to thank them for their support. We also want to encourage you to visit the ASI website to learn more about how to be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org. If you're not currently a member of the American Sheep Industry Association, we encourage you to become one by joining your state sheep association. A list of the contact people for those associations is available on the ASI website under the contacts link. There's also a join link at the top of the page where you can read more about the association activities and the benefits of becoming an ASI member. I'd like to remind our listeners that this webinar is being recorded. All <laughs> webinar registrants will, will receive a follow-up email about 40, within the next 48 hours after the webinar is over, and uh, it will have a link to that recording and also the webinar slides. The links will also be posted on the ASI website. We're scheduled for about 90 minutes tonight. We're going to start with some introductory comments from Dr. Logan, followed by a couple of 25-minute presentations from each of our speakers. Dan Persons will cover the topic of making animal health decisions, and Dr. Getz will be covering the topic of antibiotic record keeping. That should leave us with plenty of time at the end for some question and answers with our presenters. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end to submit your questions. You can do that at any time uh, during or after the presentation by typing them into the question dialog box at the bottom of your control panel. Uh, I'll monitor those questions and uh, help moderate them to our presenters during the Q&A session after the presentation. Also, if desired, you will have the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask your question directly to the speaker during the Q&A session if you'd rather do that. You will notice at the bottom of your control panel that we also have some handouts for tonight's presentations. There's four of them in total. I'd like to thank Amy Hendrickson for providing those from ASI. Uh, feel free to download those at any time uh, during the webinar. They uh, have some good pertinent information to uh, tonight's topics and uh, I'm sure you'll find them uh, very informative. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our, our speakers here tonight. Uh, Dr. Jim Logan is co-chair of the ASI Animal Health Committee. He practiced veterinary medicine for 27 years and served the state of Wyoming for 23 years as state veterinarian through two different appointed terms, from 1997 to 2004 and from 2009 to 2021. He also served as the assistant state veterinarian from 2007 to 2009. He retired in June of 2021, but continues to serve the sheep industry with his time and his knowledge. So Dr. Logan, we welcome you to tonight's webinar. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Jay. Steve Persons is owner and manager of the Rafter P Ranch, a grain and livestock operation with over a thousand ewes. He also serves as the US sales and support representative for Shearwell Data. He received his BS in agriculture education from the University of Minnesota. So welcome Dan tonight. And Dr. Getz received his, doctor, his uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the University of Minnesota in 1996. He began his professional career at Pipestone Veterinary Services as a food animal veterinarian in 1996 and remained there for 25 years as a partner specializing in ruminants. In 2021, he co-founded Windy Ridge Veterinary Clinic, where he currently practices and serves as president. His day-to-day -day practice is focused on ruminants with a unique passion for small ruminant clients and patients. Dr. Getz's non-professional time is filled with sports and equine activities shared with his wife and his three teenage children. So welcome, Dr. Getz, tonight. Uh, so with that, I think we're going to start off with our uh, introductory remarks from Dr. Jim Logan. And while he's doing that, I'll get uh, Dan, we'll get Dan's uh, slides up and showing so he can kick off the presentations after Jim is done. So Dr. Logan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jay. To introduce our topics a little bit tonight. Um, 
Good records are essential to the success of any business, including sheep production. In maintaining factual accurate records of events and flock or individual animal health conditions will help enable producers and veterinarians to analyze cause and effect of many conditions and will also prepare producers and veterinarians to avoid problems with drug residues, antimicrobial resistance, and federal, such as USDA, FDA, EPA, and maybe other agency regulations. Basically, any health sheep condition or sheep health condition should be worthy of a record creation. Obviously, some of these are more important than others. To name just a few, uh, conditions such as mastitis, pneumonia, prolapse, abortion, enteric disease, foot rot, parasites, both internal and external, retained placenta, metabolic disease, epididymitis, pink eye, abscess, sore mouth, diarrhea, toxicities, and many, many others. It's not a, an exhaustive list. Also, events. Events that routinely occur in the management of sheep production should also be recorded. And as I got thinking about this uh, this afternoon, even events such as weather events, such as extremely hot days or extremely cold days, was it raining when you did certain things with the herd in management? Those types of things should be recorded. But events that re routinely occur in the management of sheep production should also be recorded. Such things as breeding dates, lambing dates, uh, flock and individual ewe lambing dates, including single or multiple birth, dystocia, live birth or stillborn, birth deformities, then moving on to docking and shearing, fleece weights and condition, vaccinations, deaths, injuries, culling, marketing, treatments such as with antibiotics or deworming, feed purchases, pasture changes, record of injection sites, etc. So the list goes on. Individual and official identification also is critically important in flock management and also for disease traceability and food safety. So when we have our transition from Dan Persons into Larry Getz's presentation. Amy Hendrickson from ASI will uh, give a brief description of the handouts that are available on this, and that'll help you perhaps to see a little bit more about some of those particular aspects of this topic. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dan Pearson. Persons, I mean. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, this is Dan Persons, and I'm going to talk tonight about animal health decisions, um, making decisions to improve production and for the welfare of our animals. Now, a little bit about myself. You heard I, I am a sheep producer first and foremost. That's my full-time job. My secondary job is with Shearwell Data, and I do their support and um, and sales of electronic equipment and software in the United States. I've been doing that now for about eight years. And I've helped somewhere between 250 and 300 farms and ranches transition from uh, sometimes no record keeping and sometimes paper records all the way up to RF, RFID and electronic record keeping and software packages. So I'm going to start and talk about just the scope of the problem. And Jim laid out a long list of things that we really should be recording and taking care of. And, it, and it's a daunting list to uh, to sit down and think of all the things you really should do. And I I guess in my own flock, when I look at what do I need to keep track of, I I look for the low hanging fruit, those things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that are the the real problems of 
for the day-to-day -day operations that make my sheep not easy care and put stumbling blocks in the way of us doing a, a really good job on the sheep we have. And so some of the next slides uh, pertain to what I see happen in my own flock. So this is my, I bear my soul here. And so this is my own records and the end of my record keeping. So this is looking at 2022. And I looked at how many lambs did I have born during 2022? Well, there was 1,133 lambs born. 1,048 of those were born alive and lived lived long enough to get an ear tag in their ear at 24 hours of age, which left 85 lambs that were still born or aborted or died before tagging and dropped you pretty quick from a 213% lamb crop to 197% lamb crop. But in the scope of everything, what's also important is to look at where did all the lambs come from? Um, if I had those kind of numbers with 85 stillborns and abortions and and it was all used that had twins and twins and maybe singles, well, that's a major problem. But we have a flock that's highly prolific and a lot of our ewes are having triplets and quads and quintuplets and sextuplets. And those are more problematic to to deal with and end up with more stillborns and aborted. But this is where we start from. We had 1,133 potential lambs that that if we could do 100% keep everybody alive, that's what we would have sold. So what did my animals die from? And here's my here's my list of the top end of it. And there's a few more that would be at the bottom. But, uh, and so these are in order of how many incidences of each one of those things happened in my lambs and in the ewes. So 65 lambs were stillborn. And then I didn't put the numbers on the starves and pneumonias, but navel ills, there were six. So all of these that are in between are somewhere between 65 and six for the amount of deaths. Um, and of course, died before tagging, that's somewhere in the 20 lambs or so. We had 85 lambs that were stillborn, aborted, or died before tagging. So I know what's up and down from that. But where's my low hanging items? It's starvation, pneumonia, and type C. And then I get into the bottom ones and, you know, it, it's still six lambs of navel hill, but six out of out of the total number of losses is not that many. And on the U side, pneumonia was my number one cause of death in use. But we also, the second cause was, I can just call them weak and starved. Those use that just, they just fail to pick up after, after lambing or after weaning. And they just, they're literally weak and starved to death. But it's less than 13. Because 13 was my big number. So, and then the rest of them are all the way down to just one belly rupture and a, a sprinkling of other little things that you died from. So, that's what they died from. What did we treat for? Because it's two different things. Some things they die from and we never treated, others we're treating for, but they're not going to die from it. Um, so we have our lamb crop. We treated for foot scald, and again, this is in this is in order of how many got treated. I don't have the numbers on on them, but it's in order of how how many times did it happen. So foot scald was my biggest one in the lamb crop. Pneumonia is number two, and then clostridial and infections and injuries and starvation. In in those orders. Um, and we we really thought that starvation was higher in the list, but we started cutting a bunch of lambs open, and we really started looking at at why did these lambs die. And it turns out that a lot of animals that we thought were dying of starvation had pneumonia. Their lungs were black already, 
yeah, and their, or their lungs were compromised. So while it looked like they starved, and they did, they starved, but they starved because they had pneumonia. And in the U side, what did we treat for? Abortion agents, number one. And that was just trying to control chlamydia in our flock. We don't, haven't had a Vibrio outbreak ever, um, but we do treat regularly as a preventative for chlamydia. Foot scalds, my number two in the U's. We, I live in West Central Minnesota and I live on a very gravelly, sandy farm and the combination of sharp sand, sharp gravel, and a lot of rain, I end up with foot scalds. And so we do end up treating for that. Pneumonia is the third cause, and then infections, mastitis, and a, literally just a sprinkling of worms and parasite problems. Um, after all, we're frozen for about eight months out of the year, so it's a little tougher for worms to get a, a grip on us here. So that's what that's what they died for and what we treated for. Now, how do we shrink the list? Uh, first place I started looking was to find appropriate and effective vaccines and use them whenever I can to prevent any to prevent the diseases that are up on top. Um, I'm probably a way out of the mode, but we started vaccinating for pneumonia on our on our lambs and in our ewes. And it's made a difference for our flock. So we add one thing in and reduce the amount of pneumonia. Didn't get rid of it, but it reduced it. Modifying the environment of animals. Um, we added insulation and a, a lot more ventilation to our lambing facilities. And we have cut our problems of pneumonia down in our lamb crop in our early pneumonias. Got cut way back, and we haven't had to treat a lamb for scours in several years. Uh, just does, even though they're total confinement, we just don't see it anymore. Keep it dry and, and heavily ventilated. Uh, we look at the genetic differences in the flock. Uh, some of these ewes that are chronic foot rot, not foot rot, foot scald, um, we're starting to look at the genetic differences and are there some bloodlines we have that are more resistant to disease, be it pneumonia or foot scald or mastitis or anything else? Can we find any trace backs in the genetic side? We use appropriate culling. Uh, we manage animal nutrition because animals that are fed well tend to be healthier with less problems. We reduce as much as we can the stress on our animals. And we choose our treatments wisely. Uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna treat an animal that for pneumonia that we don't think we're gonna be able to get back and treat a second or a third time, we use long acting antibiotics. And so we don't just put one shot in an animal, make it feel a little bit better, but not truly cure the, the problem. And then all the time we're looking at our death losses and trying to determine cause. And I, I work with my local vet, and I also have some real trusted friends who have been through veterinary college that have helped me look at lambs and do posts on them to at least get uh, a better better understanding of where our death loss is and what they really are. So treatment summaries. This is one of the reports I can look at, and this happens to be for... Um, for just February, just the month of February in 2023. So I can look at a summary of what I treated and what, what did I treat for. And it'll tell me how many animals did I treat and what drugs did I use to treat with. So it, it really is just a summary of treatments. And then finding chronic repeats. And I think this is where we're headed next with our flock. Um, on the foot scald side, I know that I have ewes that have never had to be treated for foot rot. And I know we have ewes that are chronic repeats. Every time it sprinkles a little bit, they think they're gonna get foot scald. So we can start looking at these, the chronic repeats for treatments. 
And in this case, it takes a really good record keeping system to to be able to pull up um, a report like this where I asked it, show me, and this is just two animals. There's a, a couple more pages that have had three or more treatments just for scald in their lifetimes. So tells me where they are, who they are, and from here I can put a list together and say maybe maybe we should get rid of those ewes and uh, replace them with some offspring of ewes that have never had foot scald on our farm because everybody has the same chance to the exposure. So we look at uh, I'm going to I'm going to go back a page. We look at tag numbers on sheep, and this is a little bit off track, I think, but you'll see in the in the tag number column, some of them have a tag number that starts with 840, and it's a long number and ends in a five-digit number after that, so 05148. That is an electronic scrapey tag number for that sheep. And, and I know it is because because I did the records, but I also know that 840s are the USDA scrapey approved for animal traceability electronic chip numbers. And, but then I also have animals that have just a 00, zero and it doesn't, now that one doesn't look like a scrapey ID, but it's because of how I did my record keeping early on. And so this U was identified on a group of tags that. I didn't print the whole 840 number as part of her flock ID. And I'll, I'll take you to the next page. So here's an example. We've got animals on the top that their not, tag numbers start with 00. But if you look in the center of the column, the electronic tag that they carry is the chip number assigned to them by USDA when I bought the tags. And that is the full 840 tag number, full 16 digit uh, or 15 digit 840 number. And then they have a management tag, which in my case is a tattoo, but it could be an ear tag number as well. And they have an NSIP number and they may have a pedigree number. Uh, and important in any system is to track any previous tags that that same sheep has had. And none of these have had a, a second tag, but but that is, you'll, you'll see tag numbers and you'll see electronic tag. The electronic tag is the chip number for those animals, which is, if it's an 840 number, it is a USDA approved scrapey chip. And here's a couple of examples, uh, Shearwell tag and an Allflex tag, both of them 840 tags um, and they're, they can be referred to as an 840 tag. If you order them, the producer has to have a scrapey flock ID and a national premise ID number. They need both numbers. And the 840 tag will be a 15 digit number on the tag. Uh, it will start with 840 and producers get no choice at all on what numbers are gonna be on the tag. Other than they can tell, other than it'll have an 840 all the numbers that follow are totally at the discretion of the USDA. And that 840 chip number is linked to the producer's scrapey flock ID number. If you want to purchase 840 tags, this, this code will lead you to the USDA um, website with a list of approved vendors for 840 and scrapey tags. And again, you'll need a scrapey flock ID and a national premise ID number to use 840 scrapey tags. So reasons for recording antibiotic use. And there's there's several, some of them really good reasons, uh, and some of them are just a reason. <laughs> Government regulation. Government says you need to do it. So you need to keep track of your antibiotic use. That is that is law, you have to keep track of it. Is it a good use 
of your record keeping? I'd argue it's probably not. But the other items are, if you're in an antibiotic free protocol on your sheep, you have to keep records on those sheep to be able to pull out any lambs or ewes that have been treated with antibiotics. If you keep records, a good reason is to correlate the antibiotic uses with death losses and see are we treating the right things or or are we treating are we treating the right things but with the wrong drugs drugs that don't work for us uh, tracking common illnesses so you can find that that one item or that one or two diseases that are you're losing a lot of lambs to and i and i never would have correlated it myself without a really good electronic system of records that I can just go in and ask for a list of every lamb that died of pneumonia because on 1100 lambs you lose track of time and the amount of the number of treatments really really fast so and then tracking withdrawal dates um, extremely important to track withdrawal dates on any, any antibiotics you use any drugs you use uh, of any kind, and even vaccines, you need to you need to track the withdrawal dates, so you don't send animals to market that have any residue. In well, I won't say any residue; they have allowable residue levels in them. What needs to be recorded? The animal's number or tag number, the date you treated the person that treated the animal, why you treated the animal, what drug you used, how much did you use, and of course, what's the withdrawal date now of that animal? Did you calculate it out and look at when's the first time I can sell this animal? What else should be recorded? You should record where the drug was obtained, what the lot number of the drug was, and the expiration date of that drug. So you can monitor and keep track of what's in the medicine cabinet. Common record keeping methods. There's pocket notebooks, there's ear notching and ear tagging, paint branding, and electronic records. For a notebook, you must record all the needed information. So it's not going to happen in a little tiny notebook. Um, you're looking at something bigger than what will just fit in a in a shirt pocket to get all of the needed information recorded. They are simple to use. It takes pen and paper, but you need to keep those records available long term. It's not good enough to write it down and then lose it. You need to have a way to store that paper for at least the life of the animal, and I'd argue probably longer. It's very difficult to analyze information out of a pocket notebook. Um, if you're any size flock at all, it's extremely difficult. And it's difficult to find an individual record in a pocket notebook if, you're, if your flock is of any size. Ear notching and tagging. First thing is, it all by itself, it doesn't satisfy the written record keeping regulations. It doesn't tell you enough to just have a tag in the ear. Notching is a permanent record that an animal was treated, so that is a good thing if you're on a antibiotic-free protocol. Uh, an ear notch can suffice to be able to say, well, I treated it. But it doesn't by itself satisfy record keeping. Um, doesn't The ear notch doesn't contain the record of what drug it got, and it doesn't contain any kind of dates for when it was when it took place and when the withdrawal date might be done. Um, but it, ear notching is and tagging can be useful for antibiotic free protocols to mark treated animals. Paint marking, it's temporary at very best. And in hair sheep, paint branding just doesn't work. It might last for a day or two and then it sheds right off the off that hair follicle and Paint brands just don't stick to to the hair hair breeds. Uh, it does again, like ear tags and notching. It doesn't in itself satisfy written record requirements. Although I will use paint marking if I treat an animal with LA200 
500. They'll get a dot of paint on their head on the first treatment, and on the second treatment, they'll get a stripe of paint across the shoulders to show that I've treated them twice. So it, it does serve a purpose in marking, and I'll I'll generally put a spray paint mark where I gave the injection. So if it was in the skin under the on the neck, I will give a little dot of paint on the neck on that side where the shot was given. Electronic records, they satisfy the written record requirement. It makes information retrieval easier. It tries ties the drug the ear tags, the withdrawal dates, the treatment reasons all together in one database. RFID just makes data capture easier. You can use electronic you can use electronic records and not have RFID, but RFID makes that capture of tag numbers much easier. Um, treatment remains part of the animal's lifetime record. Even after withdrawal date, it stays on that animal's record. Um, as long as the animal is in the database. And you can begin to tie treatments, genetics, death losses, management decisions all together. Um, I could in my system go in and ask for all of the animals that have ever been treated for foot scald and ask it to put those animals in a list based on who their sire was. And within 30 seconds, it would go through eight years of records and tie it all back to what the sire lines were. And maybe at a glance, I'd see that there's some sire lines that are that are chronics for foot scald. Same could be true for inverted eyes or mastitis or pneumonia or anything else. We can tie it back on the genetic side to these animals. My med this is what my medicine cabinet looks like. So it's all the drugs I have, the batch numbers, how many CCs are in the are in the cabinet, um, and then when I purchased it, what the expiration date is, and what I paid for those drugs. And some of these are a little bit of a guess. I <coughs> I didn't go back and look right at the sales ticket on on all my drugs, but I know pretty close. I'm pretty close to what they were. Um, and expiration dates are there, and I've, and I've got some really old drugs, and some of these are gonna have to get pitched. Like Spectam, I bought it in 2012. That was about the last time I treated any lambs for E. coli scours in the barn. Just hasn't happened since then. So, so that's medicines on hand. Uh, this software will track how much is left in the bottles, and that's why some have really strange amounts. As it's used, it subtracts it out of the amount on hand. Here's what it looks like on our recorder. Um, we would go down to treatments on the recorder, and at treatments, in the next slide, it is the date of the treatment, the drug we used and the batch number that it came out of, and that would come from a drop-down menu, so you don't have to remember all of them. You'll pull it off a drop-down menu. You put in the dose you use, the reason that you treated, and again, that's a drop-down menu for the, so you don't have pneumonia spelled five different ways. You can spell it wrong once and just repeat your error forever and ever, which works for me. Uh, treated by me, and that's their tag number. Now, if I took this same animal and I treated on March 22nd, and now I say it's April 2nd, and I'm going to move it, I'm going to sell it, I'm going to move it to a sale. It flagged up on me, and it says, "Warning: the animal is in withdrawal until April 21st. Are you sure you want to continue moving it to sale?" And that's key. That it it doesn't allow me to accidentally put a sheep on a trailer that I know has been recorded for a treatment, um, it flags them up and reminds me that it's still in withdrawal. Even if the paint washed off, it still flags it up for me. We can manually record treatments, uh, particularly useful if we're doing a, a large group of animals. Uh, and it can be a treatment or it can be a vaccination.
any any kind of as Dr. Logan talked about, any kind of things you would do to the whole flock could be recorded as a as a treatment. And treatments in our system do not have to have a drug associated with them. It could be as simple as trimmed feet. And some animals require trimming and some don't. So you could keep track of those animals that always have to have their feet trimmed, where there's others in the flock that never have to have their feet trimmed. So, so you can manually record it. If you aren't using RFID, you can go in and to our software or another software with this capability and record it, record their treatments into the software. And then you can pull up individual treatment records for uh, whatever time period you want, and it would include what drug was used, what the expiration date was when you did the treatment, what the withdrawal date is, and then why did you why did you do the treatment, and what was the what was the treatment reason? My withdrawal date list for April 2nd uh, brought up that there's seven animals out in the barn that are in withdrawal period yet on April 2nd. So, now moving forward, regulations may dictate what we have to do, but management should determine the value of the records we keep. Um, and you need to make the records more than just a historical document. Use them to improve management for profit and risk profile. Um, I I think of this any time there's a government mandate that says, okay, now now you have to you have to record uh, antibiotic treatments, and the knee jerk reaction is, oh, we're not going to do that. It's just one more thing piled on us. But in reality, you need to. We as producers need to take those mandates and use them for our best interest. And that's improving our management, improving our profit, and our risk profile. Uh, and if we can do those things, it's, uh, it's going to benefit us instead of hurt us. Uh, and the same can be true with RFID. It may seem like a, a burden and an unnecessary mandate if, if it ever comes to pass. But those of us that have gone down the road, um, most of us would never go back. It's, it's opened all new air, all new areas that we can improve our flocks through improving our records and uh, man managing that data better. So I want to thank you for listening tonight. Uh, and again, we, we thank the USDA APHIS for their support of this program and also American Sheep Industry Association for support of this program. And I'll be happy to take uh, questions at the end of the program tonight, if you would have any. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And while we transition into Dr. Getz's presentation, Amy Hendrickson will give you a little bit of an overview of the attachments or the handouts. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And um, Dan, I really appreciated your um, presentation. It was great. Thank you. Um, so you will find in the handouts section, if you look there, there's a little thing that um, I think it's to the right of your um, page. It says handouts. There are four. Um, there are all of the information here are things that you can find on the internet if you went to look for something uh, related to identification uh, um, related to obtaining official tags related to the scrapey program all of this is found uh, on there i just thought that it would be helpful to bring together all of these uh, a few of these things for your benefit um, there is also an information packet that is related to the antibiotics change. Uh, all of these, all of the information in that comes from either the ASI website, which I encourage everyone to go to because it has terrific uh, information, all kinds of information there. 
Uh, but it, there's some information in this packet from the ASI website, but there's also information uh, from the uh, American Association of Small Ruminant Practitioners uh, that kind of helps you understand what this change is uh, that we are um, moving toward in June. Uh, and it also includes a sample vet client patient relationship uh, document there. So um, I hope this is helpful for you, but that was the intent behind that. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Amy. And Dr. Getz, I think we're ready to move into your presentation on antibiotics. All right, thank you very much. I assume everyone can hear me. If they can't, Jay, uh, let me know, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I titled this talk, Antibiotics, New Rule Use and Veterinary Client-Patient Relationship. And I didn't advance that correctly. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Let me change out of the viewer here. All right. I would assume you can see what I'm seeing. I'm going to close out of this box. We well, are on your first page. Yep, I'm having problems advancing it, so you bear with me a minute. All right, go. I got to get something That's out of the way. Okay, first of all, yep. uh, for disclosure, there, I needed to hide my control panel. Okay. I assume everyone can hear and see me. So for, for full disclosure, um, this project is made possible in part by a cooperative agreement from the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, and it may not necessarily express APHIS's view. First of all, I'd like to thank both ASI and APHIS for asking me to participate and present at this webinar, um, but I wanna make sure that everyone please understand that I'm a veterinarian in private practice. I am not an employee of ASI, nor am I an employee of the USDA. I don't think I will say anything that's in conflict, conflict with ASI or USDA, but please recognize I'm a private practitioner. I work with sheep producers daily. I'm actively involved in antibiotic use on farm and understand my role as the veterinarian for the farm, as well as my role um, for the public. So I'm going to touch on that. I work with producers like Dan. Um, I work with small flocks, medium flocks, large flocks um, in a tri-state area, South Dakota, um, Southwest Minnesota, and Iowa. And I'm trying to advance and it's not allowing me to advance. There we go. So why does anyone care what happens on your farm or ranch? Quite honestly, is it really their business what goes on on your farm or ranch? We all know that you as a, as a sheep producer obviously care. You treat your animals to preserve life, preserve profit. You treat your animals for your, your own business interest. And I would say nearly all sheep producers will care about their animals out of what I call a stewardship obligation of taking care of the animal. I would imagine most of us look at food animals as uh, a gift from God. Um, we're intending on eating these animals, but those animals deserve a quality of life while they're under our care. And most sheep producers take pretty seriously the stewardship obligation. I'm also gonna tell you that the public cares. The public expects you to treat the animal with dignity, to provide feed and water, and appropriate animal care, including the treatment of sick animals. Those are the expectations that the public has on us as sheep producers and myself as a veterinarian. And the USDA cares. Um, for those of you who don't know, APHIS is mandated by the public to control spread of animal diseases. The, the APHIS and the USDA cannot do this without the support of producers that are, that are, are, are listening to this webinar. Um, APHIS relies on us to help so that they can fulfill their mandate to the public by controlling animal disease. So I'm going to 
point out the obviously the pink elephant in the room that everyone's excited about, which is the FDA guidance for industry number 263. So this was published nearly two years ago on June 11th, 2021. And basically it's removing medically important antibiotics from an over-the-counter marketing channel. Um, when this was, was published, it had a two-year timeline of implementation. It's essentially requiring medication manufacturers, veterinary medication manufacturers, to voluntarily move these antibiotics to a prescription or RX status. An RX status would list on the label this verbiage, caution, federal law restricts this drug to use by or on the order of a licensed veterinarian. And the deadline for implementation is June 11th, 2023. Interestingly, if you pick up the literature or the, the, the lay journals, the, the publications um, in the last three months, this has become a news breaking story. Um, ironically, this was a news breaking story two years ago. And as we're approaching the deadline, you know, more and more people are getting a little bit excited about, about the FDA guidance for the industry. So what's the scope of this? What antibiotics are currently under an over-the-counter classification? Um, so penicillin, both the injectable form and the intramammary tubes are over-the-counter currently. Um, oxytetracycline, under, sold under a very variety of brand names, either as an injectable or a bolus. Um, sulfa antibiotics, under an injectable or a bolus. Um, Tylosin under the injectable. Tefrin, which is an intermammary tube that's over the counter. Lincomycin in the form of an injectable antibiotic. Genomycin in the form of an oral uh, product. Spectinomycin also in form of an oral product, uh, a baby pig treatment. Um, so that's the scope of the antibiotics that are currently under over the counter, and they will be required to be moved to prescription status in less than 30 days. So how did we get here? And so part of what I'm going to try to do is kind of paint the picture of why this is occurring, and then I'm also going to talk about why it's important. So pre-1940, the only antibiotic that was used in animals was sulfa. Now, there are other treatments for infections that historically are not considered antibiotics, and basically those are not used today. When I, when I talk about historical treatments, things like lead arsenic was used for deworming sheep. Um, interestingly, both incredibly toxic products that we treated sheep with um, to kill the parasites and hope that we didn't kill the sheep. Moving on to the 1950s and 60s, penicillin began to be used in animals. Um, Enter into the 1970s, the FDA began requiring manufacturers to seek a label approval from the FDA for animal treatment products. At that time, penicillin was grandfathered in, but all new animal antibiotics were required, um, the FDA required um, seeking label approval and studies to show efficacy in order to get that label approval. So, at this time, an over-the-counter approval was allowed for antibiotics, which had a wide margin of safety, were not dangerous to handle. In other words, there was no human risk of accidental injection and did not pose a significant human health residue risk. So as long as they weren't um, products that caused a great human risk, were not dangerous to administer, had a wide margin of safety, um, the FDA granted over-the-counter over the counter approval. Then things began to change in the 1980s. We started to see widespread antibiotic resistance, and it became recognized both in the medical community and in the public. The public, the public also became aware of the use of antibiotics in food animals. This led to speculation that the use of the antibiotics in food animals was causing resistance and thus could be a threat to human health. Again, this was speculation. However, the FDA began to be pressured by the public um, to address the public's concerns and the speculation. 
Enter into the 1990s, the FDA required new animal, animal antibiotics to be pre approved as prescription drugs. No antibiotics were approved in the 90s and to current under an OTC label. However, previously approved OTC drugs are grandfathered in. And through the 90s, we started to see mounting pressure from the medical community and public about antibiotic stewardship in food animals. So from 2000 to current, all new animal drug approvals were either prescription or in the case of feed additives under a VFD or a veterinary feed directive. The OTC class became an undefendable problem for the public and the FDA. The FDA was being called upon by the public to only allow antibiotic use under the supervision of a medical professional. Uh, the public would view antibiotic availability to humans only under the supervision of a medical professional. Why not animals? Why does the OTC class exist? And this is following a trend in Europe. We're just about 20 to 30 years behind. So we see pressure from the public, not from the veterinary community, not from antibiotic manufacturers, and not from food animal producers. Veterinarians weren't screaming for this. Antibiotic manufacturers weren't, weren't screaming for it. Food animal producers weren't screaming for it. The public is the one that's delivering the pressure. So today, the public supports prudent and appropriate antibiotic treatment of sick animals for the welfare of the animal, not for profit. Not only do they support it, they expect we as veterinarians and sheep producers to do prudent and appropriate antibiotic treatment of sick animals. The public expects that this treatment is under the direction and knowledge of a medical professional, i.e. a veterinarian. The public is aware of extensive use of antibiotics in food animals, not so much in the sheep industry, but in the cattle industry and in the swine industry and in the poultry industry. Now there is a perception that antibiotics will not be necessary if the animals are kept in smaller operations with a better environment, better housing, better nutrition, and better care. Again, this is a perception. There is a perception that antibiotics are used in large operations because the environment and care are so bad, the animals are sick and it is the only way to keep them alive. I would argue that perception is false. However, the perception of the public is, is, is their own reality. Okay, so also what we know, consumers will pay more for meat that comes from animals that were never treated with antibiotics. There is a premium for antibiotic free. Consumers will pay more for meat that, for animals that were not kept in confinement. There is a premium for grass fed. Consumers will pay more for meat and milk from animals that were grown on an organic farm. The consumer is talking with their checkbook. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example of a case. So, Pazolac or RBST. So this was a bovine somatotropin, which is growth hormone. Recombinant technology, spliced it into bacteria, grew up bovine somatotropin. It was approved around 1988 to increase milk production in dairy cattle. It is not an antibiotic, and there's no detectable difference in the milk from cows treated with bovine somatotropin or Pazolac and cows not treated, okay? Pazolac was not pulled off the market by the FDA. However, marketing companies convinced consumers that milk that was from non-treated cows was better, safer, and more healthy. They offered a premium to producers to deliver milk that was not treated with Pazolac. They sold that milk at a premium. They convinced the consumers that that milk was better, safer, and more healthy with no scientific data. The market pressure penetrated through the entire industry, causing the entire dairy processing industry to refuse to take milk from farms that used Pazolac or RBST. Pazolac is still approved in the US, sales in the US are zero. No processor will take milk from cows treated with BST. Okay, what exactly will change in June 11th? Penicillin, sulfur, mastitis tubes, et cetera, will not be available at farm stores. The only way a farm store can sell these products is to fill a prescription from a veterinarian. 
And in order to fill a prescription, you need a licensed pharmacist at the site. <coughs> Excuse me. Sales from veterinary clinics and veterinary distributors will not change. Veterinary distributors already are filling prescriptions with a licensed pharmacist on staff. And veterinary clinics can fill prescriptions from veterinarians that are working for them, as well as veterinarians from other clinics. What is it required for a veterinarian to write a prescription? Um, you need a valid veterinary client-patient relationship. And this has four points and all four criteria need to be met. The veterinarian assumes the role of making veterinary medical decisions for the patient farm. The owner agrees to follow the veterinarian's instructions. The veterinarian has knowledge of the animal and or the farm such that he or she can at least make a preliminary diagnosis and acceptable treatment plan. The veterinarian is available for follow-up in case of adverse medical reaction or treatment failure. And the veterinarian is licensed in the state where the animals are located. That is, re those four points need to be fulfilled to, to fulfill a veterinary client-patient relationship. With a VCPR, the burden is on the veterinarian. It relies on his or her judgment. There is flexibility and that is intentional. However, it is generally accepted that in order to fulfill a VCPR, the veterinarian should visit the farm at least once annually or more frequent if necessary. Again, this is vague and again, that's intentional. It relies on the ethical beliefs of the veterinary community to uphold the standards. It is up to the veterinarian to defend to his or her peers, the public and licensing boards, if he or she has fulfilled a valid DCPR. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a few cases and I'm gonna show you um, the importance of records, the importance of a VCPR, and what happens in the case of a violative residue. So this is the case of Dairy A. Unfortunately, these are going to not be sheep examples because these are real life cases that happen. And up to this point, I have not had any of my clients have a violative residue that I'm aware of. So I'm going to use real live examples. They're going to be in dairy cattle or beef cattle. Um, but I think you'll, you'll see how this all plays out with these examples. Again, these are 100% accurate. They all happen to my clients. So we're gonna talk about dairy A. A chronic poor doer heifer was delivered to the local sale barn with dairy A, sold as dairy A as the owner. The heifer had a violative residue for genomycin. The owner was contacted and immediately called his veterinarian, which was me, because he had never had a bottle of genomycin on his dairy. And I knew he had never had a bottle of genomycin on his dairy. So this became my problem to figure out why this happened. So I traced back the animal through sale barn records um, and determined that it was a heifer from a custom heifer grower. Now, the heifer was owned by Dairy A. The custom heifer grower was feeding the heifer. The heifer was a chronic per doer, so they sold her as a cull to the sale barn. Upon investigation, it was determined that the heifer was treated by a veterinarian from another clinic and was treated with genomycin. So genomycin has about uh, 18 months slaughter withdrawal when used as an injectable in cattle. Here's the problem. The, the owner says, well, geez, I didn't do it. It's not my problem. How come I'm being accused? Well, guess what? The heifer was presented for sale in the name of Dairy A. When you present an animal for sale, you are guaranteeing that it is free of violative residues. You cannot blame it on the herdsman, your kid, your spouse, your neighbor. The owner is responsible, end of story. So to Dan's point with the violative residue, the warning that that electronic system captures, very, very important. First defense, your name goes on a public record that is searchable on the internet. If you're a repeated offender, you could be convicted of a felony for contaminating the United States food supply. And I advanced just a little too far. Okay, so we're gonna go to the case of Beef Feeder B, 400 head small feedlot, sold cattle at the local auction market, cattle went to slaughter and one steer at a violative residue for penicillin. Upon visit from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, owner could not produce any treatment records. However, there was a record of purchasing a bottle of penicillin from my clinic. So who dropped the ball with beef feeder B? Why did a violative residue occur? 
So my clinic did not fulfill a valid BCPR. We instructed a treatment dose that exceeded the labeled dose, but did not recommend an extended slaughter withdrawal, nor did we insist on treatment records and animal identification. If I am unsure that my instructions will be followed, I am bound by veterinary code of ethics to refuse to write the prescription. So some of this blame falls on me and my clinic. Beef feeder B did not have treatment records or ID process in place to guarantee that an animal with a violative residue did not enter the food chain. Um, how did this play out? Uh, this became an education both for my clinic as well as for the beater, beef feeder, and um, we've got much improved practices in place. So how good is the testing for antibiotic residues? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to put this a little in perspective. Slaughter tolerances are on the order of parts per million. So for example, there are 10 people at this webinar and there are 5 million people in Minnesota. The amount of Minnesota people at my talk is two parts in a million. Antibiotic testing can be currently detected on the order of parts per billion. For example, if there are 80 people at this webinar and there are 8 billion people in the world, the amount of people in the world that came to the webinar is 10 parts per billion. My point is it is possible to detect a lamb that was treated at day one at slaughter and find a residue that might not be violative, but find a residue of antibiotics. So the future, according to me, both veterinarians and producers are and will be held accountable for antibiotic use in animals. We answer to the consumers who choose to eat or purchase our product. They are, pay, they are the ones who are writing our paycheck. We have to listen to them and we have to deliver what they want. They expect it to be raised in a safe and wholesome manner. Rules are in place to keep us safe and prevent us from doing something stupid. Follow the rules. All right. So follow the rules. We're going to talk about the case of Dairy C. This happens to be a 2,000 cow lactating dairy. A slaughter cow that was sold to a local auction market was delivered to a cow plant, Wisconsin, and had violative residue for sulfur. Dairy C was implicated based off a pl plastic purple 72 ear tag or 71 ear tag. Dairy C had both electronic and written treatment records, along with two forms of USDA tamper-proof official ID. These cattle were carrying a bright USDA steel tag, as well as an official RFID tag. Furthermore, Dairy C cows were back tagged at the sale barn by a USDA official slaughter back tag at the auction market. So I'm gonna make a little point about USDA official animal ID. It is vital for animal disease tracing and control by the USDA APHIS. Uh, USDA APHIS is our partner. However, it doesn't stop there. USDA official animal ID can be used as support of ownership. It identifies that you are the owner at the time of tag application. It can support transfer of ownership to others at a defined time. For example, in the case of of the sale of animals and a, a paper trail with a health, a, a health paper, a certificate of veterinary inspection. With complete written or electronic treatment records, uh, an official animal ID can be used to defend practices on your farm. Official tags must be acquired through USDA official vendor. This is the link to the website. Amy had a PDF that has more information about it. Um, and this happens to be two examples, uh, or three examples actually, of common USDA scrapie identification, okay? So, the case of Dairy C, I'll show you why that was important. Upon inspection at the dairy and at the request of the attending veterinarian, that was me, I was the attending veterinarian, and I called the USDA and I requested an inspector come out and examine the farm because I first told the plant there was no chance that a cow could lose three forms of official ID between Pipestone and the cull cow plant in Wisconsin. They hung up on me. Then I went up the chain to the USDA. 
I insisted that they come out and visit the farm. And the inspector report to the FDA that there was zero chance of the dairy being responsible for the violative residues, and I required that in writing. The FDA sent the formal apology to Dairy C for accusing them of the residue violation. The burden of proof is always on the producer. Records and identification matter. In this case, we had the records to support, we had the official tamper proof IDs to support that Dairy C was not the person that delivered Bangle Tag 71 um, to offered for sale. So do what is expected. And then guess what, guys? Don't be afraid to show the world that you follow the rules. You ought to be proud of it. And I was really proud to show um, anybody that was interested that this dairy was following every rule. They had written electronic records. They had multiple forms of official ID. And in this case, we could prove that the violative residue did not come from this dairy. So now I'm going to give you another example, and I think I'm okay on time. Um, this is a case about Jack, my son. Some of you may know me. Some of you may know Jack, my son. Twelve years ago, Jack was born. At 24 hours of age, Jack had an elevated white blood cell count and a fever suggested of a bacterial infection. They did blood cultures, and they were negative. So we've got an... Uh, an infant that we suspect has a bacterial infection, but we couldn't culture it out of the blood. We're not sure where the infection is. And we're not sure what the bacteria is. So Jack was admit, admitted to neonatal ICU. Again, these are all true stories. Antibiotics are started based on the fever and the elevated white blood cell count. So which antibiotics are chosen to treat my son Jack? I had this conversation with the internist. Antibiotic choice is determined based on the culture and sensitivity of patients, of, of isolates from patients in the neonatal ICU at that hospital for the previous 12 months. Jack was treated with denomycin and potassium penicillin, which combined a broad spectrum and synergistic with very little documented resistance to the combination in the hospital where Jack was admitted to ICU. Phenomycin has been used in humans since the 1970s and is an over-the-counter drug in animals since the 1980s. It's commonly used in the form Garrison baby, baby pig pump. Penicillin has been used in over-the-counter the drug in animals since 1950. So you may look at antibiotics like penicillin that have been around for a long time and antibiotics like genomycin and you may say, well, geez, why are they worried about um, use of penicillin and genomycin? They've been around forever. There's certainly newer drugs that, you know, are more important. And, and is penicillin and genomycin medically important? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd argue that neonatal doctors, nurses, and certainly in Jack's case, the parents of neonatal patients all would consider penicillin and genomycin as medically important antibiotics. So. I guess the bottom line and to summarize, um, it's okay to listen to what the public concerns are. Um, we in the industry can be proud of what we do and how we take care of the animals. Um, treatment of, of the animals under our care is necessary and we should be afraid to do use antibiotics. Use them under the guidance of a veterinarian that has a VCPR relationship with you. Track the treatments, either electronic or paper records. Use good identification, preferably a USDA um, identification. And then be proud of what you do. Don't be embarrassed because you're doing what the public expects. You're doing what you should be. You're following the rules and you ought to be proud to follow the rules. So I guess with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator, and I do believe we have quite a bit of time for some questions. Yes, we do, Larry. Thank you for that. Um, and we've had some questions come in. I don't know. We'll give Dan a moment to get back on. And Amy and Jim. There we are, Dan. 
Hey, so once again, uh, folks, if you have questions, just type them into the question box and uh, and we'll just work our way through them with the time that we have. If you'd like to rather just uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak up and ask those questions, we can we can do that. Just raise your hand and we'll and we'll get to them. Um, I don't know. You want me to go first, Jim? I'll go through the questions here and I guess beat them to there. We had some questions come in on pneumonia vac vaccinations. Uh, I believe, Dan, you mentioned something about pneumonia vac vaccine at some point early on in your talk, but uh, people were wondering uh, what pneumonia vac, what do you use to vaccinate lambs for pneumonia and is it over the counter? So I'll Dan, you want to start? Maybe Larry wants to pipe in too. <laughs> I should let Larry pipe in first. <laughs> I didn't get it from Larry, and Larry and I don't have any connection. He is not my he is not my veterinary client. I know Larry, I respect him, and but he, I do not use Larry as my veterinarian. But I uh, I use an intranasal product on my lambs called Once. And which isn't really once because you end up doing it twice. But we uh, we give an intranasal dose to the lambs at generally about three to four weeks of age, and then again at weaning. And then my ewes also get a hemolytica vaccine about two to three weeks prior to lambing, and that's boosted annually. So, but I would encourage you to ask a lot of questions and. Talk to other people that are doing it. Talk to the veterinarians and get their take on it. Um, I just stepped out. I, I mean, I know a lot of producers from across the country, and I talked to a few of them that were vaccinating, and they led me down a path. And we cut our we cut our pneumonias at least in half from one year over the next. Now you could argue, you can also argue was it the vaccine or was it just really got lucky the previous or the next years, and it could be both. But um, nonetheless, now we're in our second year of it, and this year as well, our pneumonia cases are way down. So, but weather is huge on it. Barn environments play a big part of it. Nutrition's a big part of it. So there's so many moving parts to those things, but um, but that was my huge, that was my number one death reason in lamps for about two years running, and now it's now it's moved down the list. So I'm I'm happy with it, but <clears throat> I think uh, it'd be interesting to hear Larry's take on pneumonia vaccines. <laughs> So, there you so go Dan, ahead. while we don't currently have a VCPR, I have been to your farm. You have <laughs> I been have to looked it, yeah. at records at your table. And I just want to point out a few things. First of all, um, all all biologics are this this new rule is only applies to antibiotics. It does not apply to biologics or vaccines. So all vaccines are over the counter. So uh, don't don't worry about that. Um, the next thing I'm gonna say is um I hope you caught what Dan did in determining should we even consider a vaccine. And the first step was to identify um, treatment or death loss associated with the disease. The second step is to confirm that's truly what it is. So I don't know if you caught Dan talking about opening up dead lamb carcasses to look really what is the cause of death. And he said, we thought they starved until we opened them up. Yeah, they starved because they had black lungs and had really bad pneumonia. So it is very important to do the groundwork to understand, is it truly, are we, are we chasing the right disease? Identify the death loss or treatment cost first, then, then make sure you're chasing the right disease, whether that's diagnostic lab submissions, post-mortem exams, I don't care. And then start looking at treatment options. Okay. So that has to be the flow. It does no good to introduce an internasal vaccine to treat a pneumonia problem that isn't pneumonia. Okay. So you got to make sure you're following um, 
kind of the flow chart or the logic saying, is this truly disease? Is this responsible for my treatment costs or death loss? And then talk to your veterinarian about what you can do to improve it. Um, and it, it might be ventilation. It might be um, something, of a vaccine that's in a bottle. It may be an antibiotic, but that's the logic to go down that road. So I was really proud of you, Dan, how, how, you, how you, you made a special point of that in your talk. That was really good. Hey, thanks to both of you. And Jim, if you have anything add, to add, feel free to do that. Yeah, well, I would like to add a couple of things. When I was in practice, it, we did commonly vaccinate uh, in my practice area for Pasteurella pneumonias, in, especially in, in feeder limbs, and it made quite a difference. One thing I would caution on, though, when you're using a vaccine is you need to be sure that, that the vaccine is labeled for use in, in your species. Um, another comment, and Larry, you gave a great uh, history on the antibiotics and on both of you actually, Dan, Dan and Larry both gave a great uh, presentation and, and an update on why record keeping is so important. And it struck me, and he, neither one of you actually came right out and said this. I think you came pretty close to it, Larry, when you gave us the example of the dairy that was ruled out of a trace back uh, because of good records. And I've heard a lot of producers clear across the country, both cattle and sheep producers, that are worried about traceability because they're afraid if they put a tag in their animal's ear, they're going to have somebody come back on them for it. Well, Larry's example was great. Uh, I've seen cases where good records, including good individual animal ID, ruled people out of a trace for, for instance, for brucellosis, but I've seen this happen with TB and other things. Good records can rule you out of a trace uh, probably more often than they would rule you into a trace. And that's real important. So good records and good ID are vital. Thanks, Jim. That's good insight there. Um, Dan, one question came up uh, on the software you were showing. Just, you know, what is it in, in uh, the database that you had there? And I'm pretty sure I know what your answer is going to be, but go ahead and expand on that as you wish. And then I have a follow-up question for you. So I do use, uh, I use the FarmWorks software by Shearwell Data. And that's the company that I work for part-time, but it's a pretty extensive piece of software written in the United Kingdom, so it has a little bit of a British flair to it. But at the same time, when we looked at Larry's slides and it said we're 20 to 30 years behind them, they've already got everything we're talking about built into their software because they had to do this many years ago for uh, on the antibiotics and treatment side. So, so I do use Shearwell Data's uh, FarmWorks software and their and their recording systems. I'm gonna add one thing, and it's kind of off the software, but I deliver lambs about every two weeks to a station, and I have been asked multiple times by people that are in line with their trailers behind me at the drop station that find out that day that they need a scrapey tag in their ewes. And they will walk up the line trying to find somebody to give them a scrapey tag to put in their ewe that day at the auction market. Do not do it. Your tags are your tags. Do not ever give your tags to someone else unless you've sold the animal to them. Because your tag in their ear means it came from your farm. And it's indefensible. It has your tag in it. So I just wanted to, you know... If your neighbor calls and said they ran out of tags, well, that's really too bad because do not give them yours. Uh, they can pay the fee at the collection site or wherever, but do not share your tags with anybody else. So, okay. <laughs> message <laughs> done received. With, done with my rant. Yep. Got a good message. <laughs> so my follow up is with because I know we have a lot of small flock producers on here. Um, any advice for folks on, you know, hand record keeping, when to get software? You know, what are the key things 
Uh, are there any good hand record examples out there? And then when do they get software to keep track of things? Because I know there's a lot to keep track of and there's certainly advantages to software, but facts are some people have really small flocks but still need to keep yep. track of stuff. Yep, I think I think for the really small flocks, I would I would very rapidly trans transition away from a purely paper system and go to a Google Sheets or uh, an Excel sheet or something to make it digital for yourself. So it it provides you a a long term paper trail that's uh, easily searchable. Uh, even for the very small flocks, I'd, barn cards and paper cards are really nice, but I think even for the very small flocks of five and ten U's, I think you need to transition those to some kind of an electronic format that's terrible and easy to manage. I, I would agree with Dan. Um, at minimum, you want a digital backup. Um, Little pocket notebooks tend to go through washing machines with coveralls. Um, <laughs> papers in barns get wet. Sheep, you know, fences, gates get left open. Sheep tend to eat papers. Um, when when you start saying, oh, my gosh, I know I treated an animal. I know I wrote it down. I can't find it. That becomes a problem. Because then you don't know what day you treated it. You don't know what the withdrawal is. Um, and then I would also like to say that anytime there's more than one person responsible for the care of the animal, it needs to be a community effort. Whoever sells the animal is ultimately responsible. But if we've got a husband, a wife, and the kids involved, and one's treating one morning, one's treating at night with no communication, no centralized record keeping system. That's a huge problem because one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. And that's when mistakes happen. That's when the animals get treated and don't get written down or treated continuously. So we have higher, higher treatment doses than we should have, which leads to longer withdrawal periods. So anytime we have multiple people involved in the care, uh, a centralized record keeping system is very, very important, as well as always with a digital backup. Even if it's scanned treatment sheets, some sort of a digital backup so that it, it can be pulled up in, in the time that an inspector comes, if a question is raised. Good, thanks. And somebody mentioned in the in the chat here that herd boss is an electronic record for good one for small flocks and it's free up to 65 animals. I don't know. I imagine there's some other ones that are out there that are free up to a certain size also. So no, there are there are a lot of options out there. So yeah, we also had a question on the PowerPoint presentations. They will be posted too, and you'll get a link to those in the uh, in the follow up email. Um, so some more small flock questions uh somebody with 15 head they have a good relationship with their vet but they're often too busy to come out unless it's an emergency and even then it's usually triage over the phone uh given med sight unseen can't get other vets to come out without astronomical fees you see where this is headed larry oh, yeah. <laughs> how can we better communicate and bridge the gap to practices that clearly uh you know, don't want, well, I wouldn't say don't want to, but just don't have the capacity to come out and help with sheep. Any advice on working with uh, your veterinarian to get those gaps closed? So I'm, I'm, I, I say this, I speak at a lot of meetings to veterinarians and I speak at a lot of producer meetings. So I, I see both sides. And, and what I always say to producers is don't look for the 50 year old sheep vet like myself look to the young grad because the young grad has time the young grad has the most current data the young grad's easier to access than the old gray-haired guy that's got way too many irons in the fire okay so i mean that that's who to go to go to the youngest vet you can find at the practice because chances are you're going to be able to get their attention and then you know things like um uh, texting, videos, pictures, all that stuff, 
is becoming much, much more common, much, much more common. Um, I answer emails at 1130 at night when the kids and my wife go to bed. I, you know, look at texts pulled over alongside the road in a, in a field approach. Um, that's just the nature of the, of the profession. And it's probably not going to get any better. It's actually probably going to get it worse. So we just need to find creative ways to fulfill a VCPR as well as getting, you know, the best advice we can to our, to our, to our clients. But, um, it's definitely a problem, no great solution and probably going to get worse before it gets better. So could I follow up on that for a minute? Um, Dr. Gouts, could, uh, would you say that having a VCPR in advance can help yeah, with that? Absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. And, and understand that the vet is going to want to go to your farm once, once a year at least. And, and that's pretty critical. If I'm even at a small flock, if I visit the farm once a year, I get a picture of the layout. I got a picture of the barn. I got a picture in my head of what might be some of the challenges. And all of a sudden, the photo that comes in text to me makes a lot more sense because I, I know the people. I know the situation. Um, that's part of the reason why we're required to have a VCPR so that we have knowledge of of what goes on and yeah be proactive um establish the vcpr ahead of time and you know it's probably going to be paying a, a farm visit and some consulting time once a year and and it goes a long ways a long ways and for our listeners who don't know what a vcpr is you want to just clear that up real quick for them yeah so again that was what i talked about in my slides the veterinary client patient relationship basically says that I have knowledge of the animals. I'm licensed in that state. Um, I take responsibility for making veterinary decisions. The owner takes responsibility for following my advice. Um, I'm giving withdrawal times and I'm available for follow-up if there is an adverse reaction. Okay, very good. And Larry, I wanna circle back and catch a, a question that came in early on what? before we uh, finish up here. It says, I'm now getting one or two pre pubic tendon ruptures per year in 75 views where I never had them before over 30 years. What is the cause of this? Yeah, so I I, I don't think it's prepubic tendon ruptures. It's probably abdominal um, inguinal hernias. So there's a slight difference in that with the nomenclature. Um, but abdominal wall hernias uh, will happen in late gestation, usually in use carrying uh, triplet births. Um, and they're often called belly busts by lay people, um, whereas the U approaches lambda the udder gets lower and lower and lower. Uh, there is a genetic predisposition to abdominal wall hernias or inguinal ring hernias um, in an intact male lamb that will be herniated into the squirrel sac. In a U, it's herniated above the udder. So uh, my guess is you probably brought a, brought a ram in with that genetic tendency, and that's why you're seeing more of them. That would be a high rate that we wouldn't expect. Um, that's probably more of a one out of every 300 U problem. So at that high of a rate, you probably brought a genetic tendency into the flock, and that's why you're seeing a little more of. Those are pretty hard to screen. Um, you know, not blaming it on the guy that sold you the ram because unless that dam or sister had that problem he would never know that that's a problem so but that's that's probably where it came from okay thank you and i know we're running up against our uh end time here um several people have had trouble finding the uh, link for the uh handout so if you wouldn't if you you had trouble doing that just uh send me an email and i'll try to get them to you and amy i think we'll probably find a way to maybe put a link up on the asi website with the webinar yeah. recording and stuff all of the information is available on the usda website either at the uh, at the scrapey information or on the asi uh, website, which is uh, sheepusa.org, uh, under producer education, scrapey, and identification pages, uh, or at the um, um, or under the FDA information on the ASI pages. Um, there is also information at the AASRP 
uh, website. That's a small ruminant practitioner's re website. And if you go to their resources, uh, you'll find those um, at about the very top of their resource list. Okay, thank so you. It, we can happily send them out, but you can also find them there yourselves and a whole bunch of more information that I did not include. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Amy. Larry, I got one final question for you. All right. Somebody really likes your advice of finding younger vets, but they want to know how you actually find them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been able to hire a few in the past couple of years. So I, I, I'm actually going to give a few examples. So if you go um, to the American Association of Small Ruminant Practitioners and you can go through their membership list, you might find somebody close by in that. Veterinarians that are members of the American Association of Small Ruminant Practitioners, or AASRP, are veterinarians that are interested in small ruminants. So they that that would be a potential source that I wouldn't be afraid to 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 track down. Um, now you might not find one in your area, but that's a good place to start. And then the next thing is start asking producers. Start asking local producers in the area, hey, who's the vet you work with? Do you like them or not? What do they like? Um, start talking to, to producers around the area. And um, good vets, there's going to be producers that brag about them. So uh, um, they're going to tell you the good and the bad. So I wouldn't be afraid to ask other producers. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate right. that. Okay, so I think we're out of time here. There's a couple of other questions we didn't get to. I'll pass those along to our panelists, um, give them a chance to, to respond to you. And uh, this is the, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, Dan and Larry, Jim, Amy, everybody uh, this evening for, for getting this together and for uh, providing the information and answering all the great questions. Thank you to everybody for, for joining us online. And this is the first of two uh, webinars on animal health that we have uh, planned for the summer and the next one is on July 11th and we're still working on the details of the actual agenda so so look out for that here in the near future and um, with that I think we're ready to go ahead and, and close out and just thank ASI for their uh, sponsorship of this and also USDA APHIS for the help with the funding to make it happen and uh, and uh, wish everybody a good evening. Thank you Jay for moderating. Good job. Thank you very much. It was great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Persons. Good. All right.